Have you ever wondered about how to make tiny gear pinions like this? I know I have. Join me as I try and uncover the secrets of how you and I can make gears like this in a home workshop. The damaged part comes from a Ken Pro antenna rotator. On our journey there'll be a bit of this, some of that, and a little of this. The original pinion, 7mm diameter and made from nylon or acetal, and it seems to be pressed onto a knurled section on the end of a 4mm shaft. It's cracked in two places. No sign of wear on the teeth, it's not carrying much load, and it's only used to drive a positional feedback sensor that tells the user which direction the antenna rotator is pointing. I suspect the plastic just cracked because the fit between the board of the pinion and the knurling on the shaft was too tight. I've decided to make the pinion from metal and make a new shaft rather than trying to modify the original. The first step was to try and identify the tooth profile of the plastic gear. Tricky, as the teeth were distorted from the cracks. Two of the teeth were 180 degrees apart without any major distortion, so I nipped the pinion in a vise and measured the outside diameter over the teeth, the distance between the outsides of two adjacent teeth, and then used some 1.1mm diameter drill shanks as gauge pins to try and characterise the profile. I decided to try working backwards and found some gear profile calculators. My reasoning, if that's not too strong a word, was that if I could design a gear that ended up similar size to the broken one, it might just be the right profile. As any Terry Pratchett reader knows, million to one shots always succeed nine times out of ten. I had no idea what diametral pitch or module meant, nor how to measure the mysterious sounding pressure angle. So I did the right thing and watched this old Tony video. That was great. I now knew exactly how little I knew. So with an enhanced degree of confusion, I looked at my favourite picture book. A 48 pitch 12 tooth gear seemed a little too large in diameter, so I decided to check whether the mysterious module might match my metrological measurements. A confused glance at a table of gear suggested that I might be on the money. A 0.5 module gear with 12 teeth seemed to be closer to what I'd measured. Neil, we've talked about this before. Guesswork is not your strong point. Thus armed with just enough knowledge to be dangerous, I looked at how to make a gear with a 0.5 module, whatever that meant. All became clear. Finally worked out what module actually means. The mistake was believing it was something sensible and logical. Spoiler alert, it isn't. More about that later in the video. Right, it's time to cut some metal. This brass bar is 3 quarter inch diameter nominal, near enough 19mm in old money. I'll turn a spigot to the finished 7mm diameter, but leave a step about 11mm diameter to increase the stiffness. I should really do this in the collet chuck, but I need to adjust for concentricity when I machine the teeth later, so I'll just stick with the 3 jaw. It just wouldn't be a proper machining and microarrays video without at least one of those. This high rake insert's getting a bit past its sell by date, but it's still making pretty nice chips. I know I could just trust the DRO, but this isn't a production shop, and I enjoy using these micrometers. I've left a decent shoulder on the workpiece to stiffen it up. The cutter will just clip the shoulder, but it'll miss the collet chuck face. Next step is to reduce the shaft to the finished 7mm. I had this ridiculous idea that I could make two pinions at once. I wish I hadn't. 
It might have been even stiffer if I'd have made the 7mm shaft about half the length, but then I should have used a collet chuck instead of the three jaw, shouldn't I? I'm a rubbish machinist. When the going gets tough, the tough go shopping. At least, usually. I don't own a spindexer nor a dividing head, and my pocket money fund's a bit empty, so for once, more shopping is not the answer. I do have an 8 inch rotary table and a chuck and dividing plates, but it's a lot of faff to set up, so by some serendipitous masterstroke my rather splendid Harrig Grindall has an index every 15 degrees and just drops into the vise, and automatically aligns with the vise jaws. With the Harrig, which is really intended for grinding, the workpiece clamps into an integral V-block and the offset can be adjusted with a rack and pinion and then locked. A spindexer would be much simpler, and you could even buy them with an integral ER32 collet chuck that fits into the 5C fixture. Even a simple plate with a hole pattern and pin might be feasible. A few minutes of tappy tap tap and checks with an indicator and the Harrig's ready to roll. Doing that with the camera and lights in the way is tricky so I finished aligning it off camera and got the centering and linear alignment down to about 10 micrometers variation, less than half a thou. Hey I could have set up a half dead center in an adjustable tailstock and drilled an alignment center in the end of the part but a quick test seemed to show very little vibration or resonance and a nice clean cut, however... You really don't need an adjustable tailstock. Put down the tool catalog and step away from the computer. Cutting off internet in 3, 2, 1. I fitted the new gear cutter to a 1 inch R8 arbor and commenced my usual deep and highly technical metrological alignment procedure using torn off corners from drawings. It's a superb indication of the state that civilizations attained when with a few mouse clicks I can order a 0.5 module cutter that'll make the correct profile one tooth at a time. Truly we live in the future. Sadly, you can't just buy a one size fits all cutter because the tooth form varies with the number of teeth. More about that later in the video. My online tool store had exactly what I needed and the next day I received a nice oily involute cutter in the mail. You don't actually know what an involute is, do you? Oh, I feel so seen. I sort of know what the maths behind an involute curve is, but I'm going to ignore it because my sad, soggy, mammalian brain has enough worries without adding to its burden. After some careful measurements and trial cuts, I reckon the cutter profile is pretty close to being centred exactly between the faces as it should be. There is an argument that you should make the workpiece slightly oversize and then make the cut until the shoulders of the cutter trim it back to nominal. Speaking as a complete bozoid greenhorn noob, I'm not brave enough to try that, so I cut this thing to exactly 7mm. I used an online calculator to find the measurement over gauge pins that would represent the ideal tooth profile and depth. Then I touched off the cutter on the curved face of a test workpiece and made a cut in two steps to a little under the calculated depth on opposite sides of the spigot. By some unbelievable magic that appears to have worked exactly right. I don't know why I'm surprised, because science. However, never being one to trust my look very far, I rotated the Harrig by 30 degrees and cut another pair of opposing teeth to a little more than half depth, and then split the remainder and took 2.2mm cuts to the finished size and re-measured. It came out fine, so I went for broke and cut the rest of the teeth. Except, when I'd done four cuts, I noticed the degree ring was reading 135. 
that's not a multiple of 30 degrees, oh dear. Turns out that on the third cut, I only turned the Harrig by 15 degrees. Another workpiece ruined. Lucky it was only the test part. I was so cross I forgot to press record as I cursed the gods of machining for not preventing me from being total rubbish. Sadly, I'm a born idiot, way beyond the remit and influence of any protective deities. So, time for a remake, remodel. Ah, 1972, when Roxy Music was still good. I bought a vinyl 45 single of Virginia Plain when I was in Venice in November 1972. Nostalgia, eh? Now, where was I? Inside a dodgy canal side record store in Venice, Italy, 50 years ago. No, I meant... Oh, forget it. Over to the lathe, part off the disaster to hide the evidence, make a new workpiece, remember to drill and ream the bore to 3.0mm, recheck alignment in the Harrig, verify the cutter height, touch off, make two opposing cuts, measure with the gauge pins, and we're right back where we started from. Maxine Nightingale. Sigh. I don't have pairs of gauge pins, so I used the shanks of some jobber drills which are 1.10mm diameter, and measured the outside dimension. That gave me a result that was 0.3mm over size. OK, so how much deeper do you need to cut to get the correct tooth profile? It's not exactly obvious, but I decided that if you need 0.3mm more off the outside of the pins, then all you've got to do is move the cutter in by 0.15mm, and the slope of the shoulders really don't come into it. It should just work. The rest of the cutting process is just lather, rinse and repeat until all the teeth are formed. Does it still say that on bottles of shampoo? All the teeth look the right size, the spacing looks right. I think it'll do. I did a final sanity check with the gauge pins and a check of the outside diameter because I've got zero confidence in my abilities as well as absolutely no idea what I'm doing. Now it's back to the lathe for a quick chamfer and part it off with a 1.5mm parting insert. Good name, it explains what it does. Some folks use a craft knife, some use a steel rule, but the first thing I picked up was a cheap gauge block, so I used that to set the right edge of the parting blade flush with the face of the workpiece. If you're enjoying this, or even if you're not, I'd be immensely grateful if you'd click the like button and maybe even consider subscribing if you're not already subscribed. We need to talk about involutes. Bear with me here, this gets a bit weird. Imagine two perfectly meshed gears. Imagine flattening out the teeth so the gears become smooth cylindrical rollers in contact at their theoretical pitch diameters. I modelled this in three blue one browns Manim and added the green and blue circles at the imaginary pitch diameter. You can see how the gear ratio would be the same if these were just smooth friction rollers. 
Now divide the diameter of those imaginary rollers by the number of teeth the gears no longer have. It gets worse. The high priesthood of gearing also wanted to consider whether the teeth are based on an involute, cycloid, trochoid, hypoid, convoloid, globoid or even a Wilhaber Nobikov form. As I'm doing wild guesses today, I'm assuming it's just a nice simple involute as this isn't a clock nor is it a fancy gearbox. Involute sounds complicated but as with many things it's merely a hard word for a simple concept. An involute curve is simply the path of the end of a string being unwrapped from a cylinder. It has the rather splendid characteristic that if you make matching gears with an involute form, even though they have different diameters, the direction of the transmitted force stays nearly constant. There's a relatively simple expression to generate an involute curve. Relatively. In addition, even if the gears aren't spaced exactly right to get a perfect mesh, the curves still match well, so you don't have to do the clockmaker thing and do a load of poising to get the mesh perfect. Now it's definitely time to use the ER40 collet chuck. To make the replacement shaft I'm using 4mm silver steel bar which is also known as drill rod. I've selected a piece that measured at 3.99mm so it should be a good fit in the existing bush. First operation is to face it off, zero the DRO and then make an initial cut for the 3mm spigot to fit inside the pinion. Let's see how good that DRO is. Time for a test fit. Well that felt about right, so let's try pushing it on and see if it really does fit.
Now I need to trim the pinion to length, so I'm going to flush it against the face of the collet, then touch the tool against the collet to give me my zero reference. Looking good. There's still plenty of scope for disaster though. This lovely half millimetre grooving tool is from Simtech. It has a double ended insert that fits onto a 12 millimetre square tool. I'm using the back face of the pinion as the datum for zero on the DRO. The groove needs to be 0.75mm wide and 0.5mm deep, so the bottom of the groove is 3mm diameter. Next op's parting it off, so I'll use the usual 1.5mm MGMN parting tool. Excellent choice of camera angle there. Amateurs, honestly. Inserting the shaft from the rear of the collet lets me face off the parted off end and cut it to length. As you can see I'm very professionally not changing the camera angle. Great! Rather than simply chamfering the end I'm using this beautiful Valorb dead smooth file. I've got a rather expensive Swiss file habit. As this is literally the first gear that I've ever cut in my entire 64 years on this planet, I think it'll do. YouTube thinks you'd like this one next.